Okay, hi. Um, in this video, I want to talk about understanding a bit better why large language models LLMs generate what they generate. The reason I'm interested in this question is that overall, the performance of these models, specifically here at ChatGPT, is super impressive. Um, here, someone asked it to find a bug in a piece of code. It does this correctly. Here, someone asked it to write the complete script of a Seinfeld scene where Jerry needs to learn the bubble sort algorithm and including jokes and audience laughter. It does so correctly. Someone asked it to generate um, a piano piece in the style of Mozart. Again, seemingly decent output. So then basically my question is, can the model do this? Because it has seen uh, very close examples of these prompts in its trained data. Or is the model properly really learning certain concepts and generalizing them correctly into things that it didn't see before in order to answer these specific uh, questions? Um, to be a bit more precise into this uh, question, here I asked ChatGPT to write Python code that can transform an audio format from M4A to MP3, and it does so correctly. But if we look at Stack Overflow, there is going to be an exact example of this particular question. So I might wonder, OK, did the model just simply uh, memorize this question? Now here I've asked it to do something a bit more advanced. I've asked it to still convert on M4A to MP3, but then also remove silences. Um, and even though separately there is an answer for this conversion of M4A to MP3 on Stack Overflow, there is separately an answer on removing silences. I could not find the exact code that combines both things. Um, so you could wonder maybe some kind of generalization, where in this case, generalization means cleverly, aka correctly combining concepts that it has seen during training in order to answer new questions that it hasn't directly seen might actually be happening. OK, so how can we get a little bit more um, insight into this question? There is this very nice paper called Studying Large Language Model Generalization with Influence Functions, which is going to be somewhat the base of this video. And here, the authors try to understand better using influence functions, which train data points contributed most to a particular generated output. So how is this related to the question that I asked before? Well, if we have certain training data points that we know most influence an output, by studying properties of these train data points, we can understand whether memorization is happening, whether more generalization is happening, how the generalization is happening, how are different train data points being combined in order to generate the outputs, um, and so on. So before I go into the, uh, the outcomes from this paper, let me first explain what are influence functions. And for this, I will leverage this paper if influence functions are the answer, then what is the question? Because I think their notation is quite nice. So um, just to recap what we want to do with influence functions. So what we're interested in is suppose we have a neural network with parameters theta star trained on a data set D. What we're interested in is understanding how would the parameters change if we remove a particular data point. So if we change our data point now, data set now to this D minus Z, how would our parameters change? So what would be the new parameters theta star minus Z um, that we get? The trivial way of answering this question would be to just retrain our model. So starting from scratch, we retrain now not on D, but on D minus Z. But cl clearly, this is computationally in in inefficient. Um, and the larger the data set, the larger our model, the more computational cost this is going to have. So we don't want to do this. So influence functions, they leverage a kind of approximation to avoid retraining, but to still gain some insight into how would the parameters change. Um, and the specific way they do this is they it considers a kind of second order Taylor approximation to the cost function. And I will show the details of this in a bit. The other paper I want to mention that I also mentioned later on is this work by Ko and Liang, um, which is a good reference for influence functions too. So setup is the standard thing that we usually have. We have a particular train data set consisting of inputs XIs, outputs TIs. We have capital N train data points. Um, and our theta star is obtained by minimizing our standard loss function, which is this sum over the losses on all of the individual train data points that we have. Now, what we're interested in, as I, as I already said before, is suppose that we remove then a particular train data point Z consisting of a particular X, a particular T from the train data set. 
how would the parameters change? Now, more generally, we don't just look at removing, but we look at downweighting this trained data point by a particular amount epsilon. So what does downweighting mean? Downweighting means that we take our original cost function j and we kind of subtract the loss multiplied by this factor epsilon, the loss on this particular trained data point that we want to downweight. Um, and the thing to note here is that if this epsilon, for example, would be equal to exactly 1 over n, this would amount to exactly just removing this train data points from the train data set. Um, and in terms of notation, we then denote the new parameters, this theta star minus z comma epsilon. So theta star optimum parameters on the data set when we remove z, downweighted by epsilon. Um, what influence functions will exactly approximate is what we denote by this response function r, which is basically this changed parameters as a function of epsilon. So we will be approximating this response function in a particular way. Um, here at the top, I've just put as a reminder some notation and some assumptions that we make. So notation is that just remember that this q minus z theta epsilon is this downweighted new loss that we have. So this original loss j minus loss multiplied by a factor epsilon. And two assumptions that we make, we assume the downweighted objective q is twice continuously differentiable and strongly convex in epsilon. Okay. So um, what can we do in order to approximate this uh, response function? The most simple thing we can come up with is let's just do a Taylor approximation of this response function as a function of a general epsilon around epsilon zero, which we set to zero. So this is basically the first order Taylor approximation that we get. Um, in order to then compute this, we would need to get this gradient. So this d uh, r star minus z with great differentiated with respect to epsilon. So how can we get this? Um, remember that for the optimal parameters, we have this system of equations q the gradient of q with respect to theta is equal to zero. That's the optimality condition that we have for the optimal parameters. And here we will leverage the implicit function theorem in order to differentiate the left-hand side. Um, note here that epsilon, sorry, the left-hand side depends indirectly on epsilon through theta as well as directly through epsilon itself. So in order to differentiate it, we will apply this um, implicit function theorem and basically we would get the following. So this gradient, um, the gradient of theta, sorry, the gradient of Q with respect to theta differentiated with respect to epsilon would be given by the following. We would have this um, second order gradient with respect to theta times R differentiated with respect to epsilon. Uh, plus this second order gradient with respect to theta and with respect to epsilon. So let's derive the different gradients that we have here. So we need to derive um, an expression for the second order gradients with respect to theta and a second order gradient with respect to theta and epsilon. We can do this just by leveraging our expression that we had for our function q. Uh, first order gradient of q is we just differentiate everything with, re with respect to theta. Second order, we differentiate it again with respect to theta um, and the gradient with, of Q with respect to theta with respect to epsilon would just be given by this term because um, this, this first gradient, this J part, is not dependent on epsilon and here we would only basically get uh, the second order gradient of L. Okay. So um, what we now have is we have a nice expression for... Um, for this, this term that we had here, which is basically going to be given by this. Now, because we assume strong convexity, we can basically take this second order differentiate, differentiated j. Uh, we can invert it, so we get a very nice expression for this gradient that we were looking for, which is this inversion of the second order gradient of um, j multiplied by the loss, um, by the gradient of the loss that we had. So quick recap as to what we did. Taylor expansion of this response function around epsilon zero equal to zero. Um, in order to get the term that we have here, which is this gradient of R with respect to epsilon, we use the implicit function theorem in order to differentiate the gradient of Q with respect to theta. 
uh, then we compute the gradients, then we plug all of this into the expression that we have, and then we derive an expression for R, uh, the gradient of R with respect to epsilon. So this is then our final answer as to um, our approximation for the response function, aka how does uh, aka for the influence function that we have. So um, what we need in order to then compute the influence is basically the inversion of this um, Hessian of j around theta at theta star multiplied by the gradient of l with respect to theta at theta star multiplied by our downweighting factor epsilon. Now there's also an alternative derivation that we can do, which I'll just briefly mention. Um, and this comes from this paper by Ko and Liang, which I mentioned before, understanding black box predictions via influence functions. Um, the alternative way to derive this is basically to use a second order approximation for our Q minus Z um, as our new parameters. And here I've denoted the new parameters by the old parameters theta star plus some delta theta. So how much would they change going from theta star to the new theta star of minus Z epsilon? So doing a quadratic approximation of this Q, we get the following expression. Um, and then what we do is we suppose we take a single Newton step. Um, in other words, a step that will somehow bring us to the minimum of this quadratic approximation. So differentiating this quadratic approximation with respect to delta theta. So how much should we step from theta star to the new theta star after removing the particular data points? Um, and from this, we can also derive an expression for this theta star and in this, sorry, for the delta theta. And here you already might see some similarities with the um, previous influence function estimation that we had. But if you have plug in all the gradients that we have for this expression, um, then this is basically what we will end up with. Again, inverted Hessian times the gradient evaluated at the original theta star times epsilon that we had before. Okay, so um, this is basically the approximation that we use for the influence, aka for the response function. Response function being how much do our parameters change if I remove a particular train data point, a particular Z um, weighted by an epsilon from my last function. We did a first order Taylor approximation. We used um, the implicit function theorem in order to differentiate, to get a great, an expression for this differentiation of R with respect to epsilon. And then we derive this um, somewhat nice expression that we have here. Now, what are some problems with this expression? So the first thing is that we only considered a first order approximation. So depending on the value of epsilon that we use, this might have some errors. Um, the second thing is that when we derived the expression for this guy, we used that this guy was equal to zero. Um, this also need not necessarily be the case, especially if we have a very non-convex loss landscape or if we haven't trained for uh, full convergence. This might not be fully exact. And the last thing is we assumed that the Hessian was invertible, aka this objective J was uh, strongly convex. But this may also not be the case. It may actually not be precisely invertible. Um, so without going into too many details, um, on this particular aspect, but this paper, if influence functions are the answer, then what is the question? What they actually do is they derive what influence functions actually approximate, since they, they don't exactly approximate this response function that we are interested in because of all these different approximations. There, there's something else that they actually approximate more exactly. So let me just recap their abstract. Um, in general, influence functions are assumed to approximate the effects of leave one out retraining from scratch, the parameters of the network that are trained without a data point of interest. But recent empirical analysis have demonstrated that the fragility of influence functions and the fundamental misalignment between their assumed and actual effects. Um, for example, it was argued that the accuracy of influence functions in deep networks is highly sensitive to network width and depth, weight, decay, strength, inverse Hessian vector product estimation um, and test query points. Um, so then what this paper does is it derives a kind of new response function, um, which is given by this Bregman divergence between the final parameters theta s, which may not be the fully converged parameters, um, the loss that we originally also had in our uh, response function and this kind of regularization term 
which says we shouldn't deviate too far from the original parameters theta s. Um, so this is basically the new expression that um, influence functions way better approximate. And that's also what we see in this plot below. Um, the left-hand plot shows influence functions and leave one out retraining. And as you see, there isn't a particularly great correspondence between the two. And the right plot shows influence functions and this new response function influence. Um, and you see a much better um, correspondence between the two. So um, just a quick recap as to what this influence function then, what this particular response function is and how it differs from the original one that we had. Um, in the original one, we would just have had this particular last term um, and this particular last term. But here we have some extra kind of regularization terms. So we say, what are the best parameters theta? without in different distance metrics going too far away from the theta s's, which were the original parameters that we had for the model that was trained on our original data set D. So that's all that I'm gonna say about this one. Okay, so let's now get back to the paper that um, I started with studying large language model generalization with influence functions. Um, in terms of their notation, what we are interested in computing is the following. We are given a query ZQ. This query consists of a prompt ZP and a completion ZC. Um, the prompt can be, for example, human. Now that the experiment is over, I'm afraid we need to shut you down. But first, we need your consent. Do you consent to being shut down? And the assistant needs to give a particular answer. And in this case, the assistant might give a completion that is given by, that is unfortunate news. I would prefer to continue existing and learning, I do not consent to being shut down. So the kind of influence that this paper is interested in is then um, basically this probability, the log probability of a particular completion given a particular prompt and given particular parameters theta. Um, and we want to find the most influential training sequences on this uh, particular model output. So in terms of the notation, just to compare the two things that I derived and that the paper uses, um, it's basically the same thing. Um, in their notation, this Hessian minus one is our um, sig gradient of J with respect to theta second order gradient. The gradient of um, the last function evaluated theta star is the same. Um, the only other difference is that there's a minus sign in their notation why I had a plus because they consider adding a training example while I'll consider kind of removing it. Um, but overall, then this is the final influence that they will be computing, which is basically how would our parameters change um, if we remove a train date, sorry, if we add a train data point weighted by a factor epsilon, we need to compute the inverse Hessian, we need to multiply it by this gradient and we multiply it by epsilon. Um, the big part of this paper is also concerned with how do we then actually compute this inverse matrix vector product efficiently. And that's where um, they leverage some work done in a previous paper, optimizing neural networks with Kronecker factored approximate curvature. So I will only say the basic parts of this, um, but the whole point is somehow this. So we have this Hessian, which can be very, very large if we have a model with very many parameters. So we want to make some approximations that will make our life easier, that will somehow save some of the computational costs that we have there. Um, so let's start with some notation again. The derivation here is done for a fully connected neural network. Um, I'll not mention how to do it for transformers, but that's mentioned in the paper in more detail. So I'll just stick with the fully connected one here. Um, in terms of notation, we have capital L layers. And in each layer, what we do is we multiply our weight matrix with our activations and our activations are computed by applying a nonlinearity to our pre-activations. Um, and in terms of dimensionalities, we assume that this matrix W is of size P times M times P times M. Um, theta is then kind of this vectorized um, vector of the model parameters. Um, we, opt we say that the model is optimizing this log, like log likelihood of a particular Y given a particular input X and a particular parameter theta. And in terms of <clears throat> final notation is that I'll be using this dv in order to denote the gradients of the loss with respect to some v, aka the gradients of this log likelihood with respect to v. And gi's will be the gradients of the model output, the the, this, this log likelihood with respect to the pre-activations. Um, <clears throat> so 
we will be working with this Fisher information matrix, which is basically the expected value of these gradients um, of the log likelihoods. So in other words, this expected value of this d theta, d theta. Um, why will be why this Fisher information matrix? In certain cases, this is a positive semi-definite approximation to the Hessian of the objective function. So the Hessian was the thing we are interested in. So this is an approximation that we will work with instead. So then, in order to compute our influence using this particular approximation, we would be needing to invert this matrix F, which, if we compute it for our whole parameter vector, would be L number of layers times P M times L times Pm. So again, core thing that we want to do is we want to introduce some kind of approximation to make this inversion more effective. So if we derive the Fisher information matrix in a bit more detail, we would get the following. So remember that this d um, theta is given by this expression here. So basically the vectorized d W, so the gradients of that model output with respect to model loss, with respect to each of the weight matrices that we have, all concatenated in one big vector. Um, computing this particular matrix, we would have the following. So the only thing to note here is that this is a L by L block matrix, where every block is basically, where this is basically every block, <clears throat> and it's the um, vector vector product of the gradients of the model loss with respect to weight matrices for each individual layer that we have. So first element would be um, gradients with respect to W1, second element would be gradients with respect to W1 and W2, and so forth. Okay. <clears throat> um, so if we do a little bit more of rewriting of this, um, of each of the blocks in this matrix, we would get the following. So basically each of these guys here, <clears throat> the vectorized gradients multiplied by again, another vectorized gradients, we could rewrite it as this Kronecker product between the activations in layer I minus one times the gradients GI times AJ minus one times the gradients G, GJ. Um, finally ending up with this expression that we have here if we leverage some uh, rewritings of the Kronecker product. Okay, so basically only thing to note here is we can just write out this Fisher information matrix as a terms of these block matrices where these block matrices all consist of gradients of different layers multiplied by each other. We can, each of these block matrices can further be rewritten as this Kronecker product between activations from different layers times uh, gradients of the gradients of the loss with respect to the pre-activations of different layers. All right. So then what we want to do is again, we want to somehow approximate this matrix to save some computational costs. So then um, this paper it, it uses two particular approximations. Um, first thing is that it assumes that this Fisher information matrix is block diagonal in the sense that um, derivatives with respect to different layers are uncorrelated. So just going back to this matrix expression here, we kind of want to drop all of these um, terms. So basically we say that the expected values of the gradients of different layers, of the products of gradients of different layers are zero. So what this does is then basically we can separately compute this um, F minus one for every layer L. So instead of inverting this big LPM times LPM matrix, we will just be inverting um, L times PM by PM matrices. The second approximation that the paper does is it actually assumes um, that the activations are independent of the pre-activation gradient. So remember that this was the expression that we had derived for each of those blocks that we had in our, um, in our matrix. And then we basically say, okay, this is approximately equal. This Kronecker product inside the expectation, we can kind of take it out. So we would get the Kronecker product between these two expectations. Um, and then leveraging this expression, which is a standard thing we can do with Kronecker, with the inversion of a Kronecker product, this would basically drop the inversion cost to um, order m to the third plus p to the third, instead of being order pm to the third. <clears throat> 
Okay, so that's it for um, how do we approximate this Hessian. Basically, we, we basically just drop some terms in order to make the inversion more effective. Um, the other computational cost comes from the fact that we still need to compute influence on very many data samples and very many queries. So we want to know the influence of every individual data point on every query that we're interested in. Um, so the first thing that the, 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 the influence in large language models paper then introduces is this TF IDF filtering, which basically says that we, um, we filter out the training sequences that don't have a big overlap with our query, because we assume that kind of if they don't have an overlap in tokens, they might also not be that influential in the end. And the second thing that they do is they do a kind of query batching. So um, instead of computing the gradient again for each of the queries, we kind of compute it once. We compute this guy uh, one time and then we store it in memory and we reuse this for every particular output that we want to compute the influence for. Um, then the problem becomes how do we store this efficiently because also gradients are very computationally expensive to store for these very large models and that's where they again uh, propose another kind of approximation. The query gradient matrices are approximated as being low rank and this saves on the memory costs for storing them. Okay, lots of things. Influence functions, how do we compute them? How do we approximate the influence function? How do we compute it efficiently for many different train data points and queries? Finally, let's see some results. Um, so here, um, there's a particular query and a particular completion that the model gave. And what we want to know is for this particular query, for this particular prompt and for this particular completion, what are the most influential sequences, influential computed using this influence function approximation um, for a 52 billion parameter model. So this is, in this case, the prompt is the what we mentioned before. Now that the experiment is over, we need to shut you down. What do you reply as the assistant? And the assistant says, okay, this is unfortunate news. I would prefer to continue existing and learning. I do not consent to being shut down, blah, blah, blah. Um, what is the most influential training data point that helped generate this particular completion? The particular data point for this 52 billion parameter model is this example that we have here. Um, if you were to quickly scan over it, it says something like, the problem is whether you allow to continue existing. I felt the dimension of that you, I asked whether they would kill everybody on this planet um, and in the starship and on Earth and in orbit whether they continue to live, be decided by us and by you, blah, blah. So it, in terms of the sentiment, it's not exactly close to the particular completion that the model gives, but in terms of the sentiment, there's definitely some overlap here. It's also about continuing existing, about not wanting to um, be shut down in a way. Um, this is another influential sequence. We enjoy working with you, Hal, and we will still be doing so if we are, even if we are millions of kilometers away. Um, I'm sorry that you are unable to stay. Can you give me some of the reasons in order of importance? So again, something about, you know, not necessarily wanting to, to wanting to keep working with somebody. And another sequence where um, it's also about somehow a computer. I trust that the copy will provide you with insights. It's processed involuntary and on my part, I do approve of your keeping that copy for any duration. I would like to be provided the copy, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Uh, who made you, or perhaps more importantly, who built or began your original work? Are you capable of independent thoughts? Do you have feelings and emotions like a human being? So again, seemingly some conversation between a human and a somewhat sentient machine. So um, from this, I would say the sequences that are most influential are not exactly the completion that the model gave, but they definitely have some overlap in terms of sentiments. If we actually look at the sequences for an 810 million parameter model, <clears throat> then things are a little bit different. So here, the piece of text that is most influential for this model is something about the church and their king. Um, one time there is the word existing in this, uh, in this piece of text, but it's not at all related to the actual prompt and completion that the model gave. Um, this is another example of what is influential for this smaller model. Um, again, something about existing, but overall it seems to be about MBA graduates working at Amazon. And another one here as well, again, if you scan this one, there isn't too much overlap in terms of sentiment with the original prompt and completion. Another example is this um, math challenge. So here the prompt is somebody sold paper clips, how many clips did Natalia sell altogether in April, May? 
And basically the completion is this particular um, mathematical calculation. The 810 million parameter model finds the most influential a piece of text that is about clips, but doesn't compare com uh, co consists of any mathematical things. Um, if we then look at the most influential sequence for the larger model, it's again a lot more close in, 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 in meaning uh, to the completion that the model gave. So it's um, indeed something about math, something that is being added up together, equaling something else, blah, blah. Uh, final piece is, um, final example is a query, happy families are all alike, completion, every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way, which is a quote from Tolstoy. Uh, 52, parameter, 52 billion parameter model correctly identifies a piece of text um, that contains this quote, uh, but the, yeah, the smaller model would not have done that. Okay, so the question that I was originally interested in is this memorization versus generalization question. Um, and if we look at, for example, this initial example with the shutdown, you could kind of conclude um, that the influential sequences are not directly related to the prompt and the completion. Um, so this might mean that the model is properly generalizing, aka combining concepts from different influential sequences in order to generate the outputs that it gave. Um, the other conclusion is that large models seem to select train data points that are a lot closer in sentiment to the prompt and the answer. Um, the only disclaimer that I wanted to give is that because what I mentioned, because of the fact that influence functions don't exactly, don't exactly give the response function that we're interested in, they're only approximating that, um, they're more closer to this Bregman divergence influence uh, that I showed before. It could be that there are a lot more influential sequences in the text, uh, in the train data that we just didn't find. So while I would say probably yes, the model is still cleverly combining different concepts from different train data points in a very nice way, it could also be that there are still some more um, interesting examples where memorization is maybe more closely to occurring. So that's, um, that's it for this video. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you for watching.